we'll start this presentation on surface water mapping. Uh, we'll be diving in and out of this presentation throughout the module. We'll cover a few slides, go back to code, and we'll come back to some of the slides. Uh, the goal of this module is to help you understand different water detection technique and use one of the data sets to create a surface water map. So surface water detection may sound simple. You might say, okay, we already learned how to use an index and do threshold. Uh, why, what's more, there more to learn? Detecting water globally or, or over time reliably is a hard problem because water is not as kind of as, uh, if your water was always pure, perfect water everywhere, it would be easy. But, you know, water will have some sediments, it may have some algae, it may have other organic matter, the water depth appears differently, the reflectance will be different. Uh, and depending on the contents of the water, uh, the reflectances would be very different. So you compare two water bodies in two different regions, uh, the same threshold, same index may not perform well. And that's why detecting water is not a straightforward, easy problem. And there's been a lot of research done over you know, the history of remote sensing, and we have pretty good solutions now. Uh, we're going to cover each of those and, and you can pick the one that works best for your requirement. You can read this paper that kind of gives an overview of uh, why detecting water is difficult and what are some of those uh, techniques. So you can read this chapter from this book. Uh, in this course, we have distilled those techniques into different methods. So uh, the first technique is the single band or a water index. So you compute an index, MNWI, AV, or use a single band like a NIR band and do a manual threshold. So you use a zero thresholding or some other manual thresholding and you can detect the water access. Simplest and quite easy to implement. This, if you're just doing for one region, one off thing, go at doing this, this will be the simplest, most reliable. You can also interpret this much easily. You can say, why we got this as a water pixel? Well, because you would define the algorithm. It's much easier to interpret, but simpler to implement. Uh, to go further in a bit, if you are doing this for a large region and say, I have multiple watersheds or multiple countries that I'm trying to do water detection, my thresholds are not stable, or you're trying to detect water over time and you have not, uh, uh, you want uh, thresholds will change over time. In that case, you can do some automated threshold methods. The most popular technique used is called Otsu thresholding. I'm gonna show you the script tomorrow. It's in your supplement to do Otsu thresholding, uh, where you have a you know two classes in your image uh, and you want to detect uh, the optimal threshold to separate those two classes. You can use uh, Otsu thresholding. We have an implementation in Earth Engine that you can use, uh, give it an MNTWI band and it'll give you the optimal threshold for your region. It works quite well. So you can use to some automated techniques. There is a double or two and other techniques also available. Then there is uh, something called expert system, which is where you define a set of rules that will look at your bands and indices and find out based on those rules, classify them to water versus not water. Uh, and these rules can be as simple as the rules that we define. NDWI greater than zero, NDWI less than zero. Like that's an expert system. You define the rules, and you can detect water based on that. The, the most uh, popular data set that used this system is the global surface water. This, the GSW data set is currently the gold standard in detecting water from satellite image. Uh, none of the other methods have come close to the reliability and the accuracy of this method that they've developed. We're going to work with this data set in detail. Uh, this is a ready to use data set where they have detected water from Landsat images for 40 years of time series. And yeah, they have detected water uh, using this uh, uh, expert system. Uh, we have referenced the paper in this presentation. So do read the paper. It's a very novel, interesting approach on how they figured out what are the uh, decision tree and what is the rules that they came up with. There's machine learning. Uh, you can actually do clustering. So you can uh, apply some uh, automated clustering techniques to uh, do the detection. We have an example we'll cover in a machine learning module, which will use unsupervised classification to detect water. This is currently my favorite way of detecting water. Works re really well. You can combine multiple indices. Works with Sentinel-2 really well. And we've seen very good results. So this is my current recommendation. If somebody asks me, give me a reliable way to detect water globally, I would say use this clustering 
the water detect paper came out. They had an implementation in Python, and I've implemented this in Earth Engine uh, using the Earth Engine API. Uh, it's available in your code. We'll cover that in detail in our machine learning module. You can also do supervised classification. If you have some training samples, you can train a model and classify the image into uh, water versus non-water classes and detect water. That works quite well. You also have deep learning techniques. Uh, you can use uh, a CNN or a deep learning model to be able to uh, detect water from satellite images. There are some examples uh, of the existing networks given here. Uh, again, I find that a lot of their results are good, but all of them use the global surface water as the uh, training data, right? So they use that as a training data to do this. Uh, so uh, if you want to do deep learning, you can check out those. They are ready to use models that you can use and try to classify the image. Uh, in my personal experience, the expert system global surface water works really well. It's based on Landsat. And so if uh, working with Landsat, use that. Uh, if I'm working with Sentinel-2, I would use the clustering method currently. We're going to cover all of this except the deep learning methods in the course in depth. All right, expert system. This is the data set, Global Surface Water. It was a remarkable study, uh, groundbreaking when it came, first came out. It took all the Landsat scenes from Landsat 5, 7, and 8 and used Google Earth Engine to develop and implement this algorithm to detect water and have a consistent time series, some monthly time series from 1984 to 2021. 38 years. Um, and you have this data set uh, available in our center. So the good part of this is when they ran the study, they generated a lot of products ready to use output products, the detected surface water maps and the images with water and not water. Those are available in Earth Engine for you to use. So if you want a ready to use water data set for your analysis and say, I want to compute the surface water extent of this reservoir in 1990, you can directly load this data and compute area. And you don't have to do any classification or anything yourself because the results of this study is available in Earth Engine. Uh, this is the reference to the paper and I also linked the user guide. Uh, this has produced many, many different data sets, each for different purpose. We're gonna cover them briefly uh, in this class, but if you want to learn more, look at the user guide which describes each data and all the uh, kind of caveats that you need to understand before using this data in the study. So the Global Surface Water has produced uh, these different data sets. There are three different data sets available in Earth Engine. One is the mapping layers. So if you want to create a surface water map, uh, you can use the mapping layers. If you want a monthly or yearly detection of images and you want to get those images and, and do your own analysis, those are also available. So you have the monthly data sets and also yearly data sets. We'll start with the first layers. These are the global surface water mapping layers. This data set consists of images. So when you go and find this image, it's not a collection. It's just an image that you get. It's a global image ha having different bands. Each band represents a different output from the global surface water study. There are these different bands available, and each band represents something that happened during that 38-year uh, period. Let's learn about a couple of bands and then we'll work with this data in the code. One of the bands you get in this GRC GSW data is something called occurrence. This band shows in the entire 38 year period, what was the frequency in which with the water was present at each pixel. So we would load this image, a global image at 30 meter resolution. You'll get a number between zero to 100 and saying, in the entire observation, we saw you know, thousands of Landsat images at this pixel from 1984 to 2021. Out of that, 80% of them had water. That's so why it gives you how frequently you, the water was seen at each pixel. This is quite helpful to kind of see the kind of historic uh, history of water at that pixel. And you can also use a threshold and say, select all the pixels which had 80% water in the whole period. So we can use this uh, for our analysis. The next one we have is something called max extent. Simple, any pixel that was ever detected as water will be marked as water. So you take all these images over 38 years and a lot of sophisticated processing was done to remove clouds and normalize them and so on and detected water. If a pixel was detected ever water, it'll be present in this data set. Uh, this I've mm -hmm. used to determine like a floodplain. In 40 years, where has the water been? 
and you can use that as a flood plane or a water mask. You can say, let me remove all possible water from my image and then do some analysis. You can use that in your data. Uh, there are many other layers and bands, but let's dive into code and we'll come back to this presentation and learn about other data sets uh, afterwards if we cover the script. Uh, any questions before we dive into code? I see a question in the chat about uh, using external images. Let's say we purchase some high resolution images. How can we use this? Uh, you can upload the images as GeoTIFF into Earth Engine. So whatever images you've got, you can upload this. You have 250 GB of storage space. You can utilize that and use this. Uh, you are especially interested in planet scope imaging. Planet nowadays delivers the data directly to your Earth Engine account. So check if your university has purchased planet. They might have already been delivered to a central Earth Engine account, which you can just access that directly. Otherwise, if you get GeoTIFF files, you have to upload it and use that. So that works. A good question about quality over different regions because the data set is based on Landsat. Now, Landsat uh, in lot part, lot, many parts of the world did not systematically capture images uh, over many parts of the world. So, for example, over US, you have a pretty good coverage in 80s and 90s. But let's say over India or other parts, you have very few coverage. May many months will have only one image or maybe no image at all. So, that month will be blank. Right? So, you have less observations. What if the image was over a, a period where there was cloud? So there are fewer observations outside the US in 80s and 90s. So that will affect the quality of that. 